I think they were just desperate to get someone because I've never done ninja stuff in my entire life. 22-year-old grad student, Rashana McPherson, who's working on her PhD in mechanical engineering. They're like, we just need a video of you looking really strong and like nerdy. McPherson combines brains and brawn. Like, I'm Rashana <laughs> doing pull-ups, doing push-ups. <laughs> she spends much of her time in the lab working on robotics research. They're like, sure checks the boxes, like bring her in. And then, yeah, I competed on the show. She's a PhD student. And I ate shit. You see that now? Oh, oh, oh! It was so much fun. <laughs> you can go watch it on the internet. Hey, I'm Roshana McPherson. I'm the director of flight controls here at Astronis. I think I was probably like employee number eight, nine or 10 at Astronis. I came in with the goal of like, in two years, I want to have designed a control system, implemented it, and like tested it on real hardware. And the folks at Astronis were like, you can do that like in a few months here. And they were right. <laughs> like three months later, my code was in space. What's crazy is I never thought that I would work in space. I'd always been really interested in just modeling dynamic systems. And I was really focused on actually bio-inspired design at the time. So understanding how do lizards use their tails to help them like whip around? How do hummingbirds control their flight in like crazy turbulent situations? And like, what can we learn from all those things to make better and cooler robots? I was a freshman, I think, in college, and I was ready to take whatever research opportunity I could get. And one of the ones that came up was looking at how these tiny little microscopic organisms would use their tails, or the technical term is flagella, and whip those around to help them move. So that was like just the first research position I could get as an undergrad. And then from there, I was actually able to get a follow-on position, which was probably like the coolest summer of my life still, studying the fluid mechanics of jellyfish. So I got to go to Cape Cod and spend all summer like swimming in the ocean and catching jellyfish. These ones bioluminesce, so they glow in the dark. So we would go swimming at night and you put goggles on and you dive into the water and it's like you're swimming through a galaxy. So you have little pinpricks of light and bigger blobs of light from the jellyfish. So it really is like a universe of lights underwater. So when I went to Stanford, for getting my PhD. And I was doing some work in a lab that was focused on birds. And the project was gonna be trying to understand how flocks of birds are able to fly together in these really complex patterns. You've probably seen this, like starlings, there'll be hundreds of them flying. And they're just so coordinated in their movements as they move through the sky, creating these like crazy patterns. So it's like, how are they doing that? What signal input are they taking? And like, basically what algorithm are they running in their heads that lets hundreds of them all move in unison together and see if we could learn anything from that to apply to clusters of drones or clusters of airplanes. So really cool project on the surface. I was really excited about it. And then I found out that in order to do that, I was probably gonna have to do a bunch of surgery on birds to put magnets behind their eyes to track their eye movements while they're flying so we can understand the signal input that they're getting. And that was just not something I was interested in at all. So I started looking into other labs. A friend of mine was like, hey, you should just come to this orbital mechanics class. Like, I think you'd think it was really cool. I sat in on a lecture and I did think it was really cool. And I ended up signing up for the class and taking the whole thing. So I was able to kind of take the dynamic system simulation and controls knowledge, and instead of applying it to biological systems, just apply it to a different set of physical systems that didn't require me to do surgery on animals. Biological systems are so complex, and there's so much noise in the system when you're dealing with a real animal. And all animals are unique and different, and there's just so many environmental factors and biological factors that it can be extremely challenging to try to model those things and then take any learnings from those to engineering. Whereas with orbital mechanics, at least the fundamental equations are pretty simple and pretty beautiful in their simplicity. I learned about this stuff called the Gauss Variational Equations. And that basically is a set of equations that tells you how do the different orbital parameters change depending on how much force you apply in different directions. 
you can look at them and reason about, well, if I am a spacecraft and I point my thruster this way and fire the thruster at this point in my orbit, what's gonna happen? Is my inclination gonna change? Is the whole orbit gonna tilt? Is my orbit gonna get bigger? Is it gonna get smaller? Is it gonna get more elliptical, more squashed? And just being able to reason about that by looking at these few equations is like so cool. You can layer on all kinds of complexity like, well, actually the sun's radiation imparts some momentum on your satellite and that's gonna change its orbit. Actually, the earth isn't a perfect circle. It's a little bit squashed and it's a little bit pear-shaped and it's not perfectly symmetric. So that's gonna mess up your like perfect orbital equations a bit. But all of those things, they pale in comparison, at least to me, to the amount of wild complexity there is in a biological system. In both cases, you wanna boil down the system to something really simple that you can build an intuition about and run simulations for. Like your model might match reality way, way better for orbital mechanics compared to the model that you build for the way that a hummingbird moves in turbulent flow. I'd say that's constant across like all engineering, really. We're just working to create models that are easy for us to use and help us build intuition and help us build systems and control systems and tools. But in all cases, it's just a model that mimics reality, but it's not reality itself. So there's always gonna be some difference there. So left Stanford after two years with a master's in mechanical engineering, focusing on control systems and simulating dynamic systems, and then landed at Astronis pretty much right after that. I started out as a guidance, navigation, and controls engineer, and then pivoted over to building out our simulation environment for GNC. So all of our like physics models and everything we needed to then build a geo spacecraft, not a LEO spacecraft. I was an engineer on the GNC team for like two years, and then I uh, got the opportunity to lead that team and be a team lead. And then I had the opportunity to build out from scratch our mission operations and ground software teams. Eventually the teams grew big enough that we were able to split them. So mission operations and ground software. And I got to lead the ground software team for another couple of years. After that, I decided that I wanted the opportunity to grow my own technical skills in software engineering. My background isn't in software development. Everything I've learned, I've kind of picked up like on the fly at Astronis. So for the last year, year and a half, I got to work as a software developer on the ground software team, like owning my own code, writing it, learning all kinds of stuff I had never learned before. And then actually just a few weeks ago, I got promoted to a new job, which is director of flight controls. So I now uh, oversee a few different teams at the company, flight software, guidance navigation and controls, and mission operations. It's been, yeah, quite a journey. <laughs> Growing up, I was a super, super shy kid. It was really hard for me to talk to people. I remember very consciously, like sophomore year of high school, realizing you're supposed to look people in the eyes and then starting to make a conscious effort to like, okay, we are conversing. I am looking at your face. Like, how long can I keep this up? And now I'm the director of flight software, guidance, navigation, and controls, and mission operations. And my whole job is being a leader and talking with people all day long. Yeah, in my seven years here, I've really been able to grow professionally and personally, especially because we started out so small and with such amazing people. There's no moment that compares to when our first geo satellite actually talked to us in space. Like I'll remember that for the rest of my life. And I still think about it. I still actually rewatch the video. We have one of three coming in. Uh, that we have on YouTube for that, like pretty regularly. And I tear up every time I watch it because it's just so intense. Uh, I think like actually seeing your stuff work is probably the most meaningful thing. Yeah, so I'm seven months pregnant. Uh, my first kid is gonna be born in December. I think about him moving around in there a lot. It's hard not to because he kicks the shit out of me all day long. Um, <laughs> I imagine it's like a really, really cozy, dark space with just whoosh, 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 whoosh noises going all the time. Mommy put shit in space that's gonna be there forever. <laughs>